Hello and welcome back to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Original Series, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love, and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends, and variations using large samples of language data. So on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Now, Corpus Cast is all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. And in this series, I'll be speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. So in this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is research into discrimination in a range of contexts. Uh, and my guest is Dr. Mark McGlashan, Senior Lecturer in English Language at Birmingham City University, just down the road from us at Aston, uh, where he's also the Associate Director of Research at the Birmingham Institute of Media and English. Now, Mark's research uses methods from corpus linguistics and critical discourse studies to study a broad range of social issues, including nationalism, racism, sexism, and homophobia. His recent work has focused on combining these interests with computational methods for the collection and analysis of large amounts of online social media, forum and news data to analyze the language of things like rape threats, far-right nationalism and anti-Semitism. Uh, so today I'll be having a chat with Mark about the role that corpus linguistics plays in this research into the broad area of discrimination. And so without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome to Corpus Cast, Dr. Mark McGlashan. Hello, Mark. Hi, Robbie. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. How are you? Thank you for coming on. No, very, very happy to be here. Oh, brilliant! It's uh, it's it's great to great to have you here. And and uh, as I just said, you you've done work in such a, a range of areas, but we can broadly kind of um, uh, frame that within the context of of discrimination. Um, before we talk about some of those uh, topics. Um, I want to start with a broader question about corpus linguistics. Um, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Yeah, uh, yeah, very broad initial question. Um, yeah. yeah, corpus linguistics, uh, it's a really exciting, very vibrant and like quite radical field. So you could you could take the, the approach that it's a set of theories and methods and ways of approaching linguistic analysis. But you think about the way in which corpus linguistics is kind of revolutionized linguistics and um, now it's it's kind of its tentacles are spreading into digital humanities and the kinds of methods and approaches that are taken for granted in corpus linguistics are becoming revolutionary to the humanities and um, human geography yeah the applications are, are really really broad so you think about the kind of context where I am now um, Birmingham Institute of Media and English how do you apply linguistic methods to media text and you look at how uh, corpus linguistics has been combined with critical discourse studies for pretty much decades now and the ways in which we can analyze media text using linguistic methods um yeah it's just testament to what corpus linguistics can do its power it's yeah as an approach so what it means to me is yet yeah, my career it's a, it's a really exciting vibrant field and I love doing it. Yeah. So how did you get how did you get started in corpus linguistics in the first place? Uh, probably very similar to yourself. So studying at Lancaster University, undergraduate, uh, working under uh, Professor Paul Baker, and I had a seminar tutor at the time, Claire Denbury. Um, so introduced at undergraduate level, loved it at undergraduate level, masters, and then a PhD. So my PhD. It was really a, a kind of, I was mostly interested in critical discourse studies and applying critical discourse studies to the analysis of um, the representations of same-sex parent families in children's picture books. So we might talk about this later on when we get on to talking about discrimination. But it was really interested in how to interpret uh, representations in a large body of texts. So my PhD was trying to combine well, the, this primary interest in how is a, a, a historically marginalized population represented in children's picture books? Well, how do you do that at scale? How do you look at um, linguistic representations over a large number of texts, but also how do you then combine that with multimodal approaches as well? So um, 
Yeah, but interest is mainly a research-based one. Corpus linguistics is the set of methods, the theories, the approaches that allow us to do really interesting things quite quickly, quite powerfully with language. And so, as you said um, in your introduction, spotting those patterns, trends, things that occur in a large body of texts, and it's all empirically based. So we're looking at real instances of language use um, and trying to find those patterns and trends. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you sort of have an example or do you have a memory of sort of one of the first times that you uh, looked at corpus data and learned something that was, oh, wow, this is such an interesting way of looking at it. Do you have any memories of one of the first things that sort of convinced you that this was a really interesting way of looking at language? Yeah, <laughs> so it goes back to Paul Baker again, doesn't it? Uh, um, so his book, so using corpora and discourse of these, um, and during seminars where it, obviously you're learning the rudiments of corpus linguistics, so you're looking at grammatical patterns, you're looking at collocations, you're looking at concordances, um, and then we, as you move through the syllabus, it was towards discourse. So how do social represent? Well, how how do you look at patterns and trends in social representations? And one of the first examples was looking at representations of boys and girls in the BNC. So how boys are uh, kind of strong and um, yeah, adventurous, whereas girls are uh, pretty and small. So there's this like this real kind of yeah at scale uh, coded representations and index well, ways of indexing gender um, around those around those ways of representing yeah, gendered identities. So that was very much in the undergraduate level and then taking that into um, obviously deeper interest later on. So when I started working for CAS, so Centre for Academic, um, Centre for Corpus Approaches to Social Sciences at Lancaster University, where we started to look at uh, rape threats as part of the Discourse of Online Misogyny Project with Claire Hardacre as PI. Um, so yeah, Lancaster, 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 really. <laughs> um, since Lancaster, you've uh, you've been working now for a few years at uh, Birmingham City University, and you've continued to develop um, an interest you just mentioned there on online misogyny being an example, and more broadly <laughs> radical online discourse, I suppose you could call it. And I mentioned before nationalism, sexism, racism, homophobia, things like that. Um, you've done quite a lot of work in this area in recent years. Uh, we'll ease our way into this topic now. Um, so I know it's not not necessarily the most uh, pleasant topic to uh, to discuss, but broadly, what are your objectives when exploring these sorts of discourses? Why, why is it important to you to um, face up to looking at these quite uh, challenging discourses uh, in online media? Yeah, interesting question. Um, it probably comes down to uh, very central concerns in critical discourse studies. So how are certain marginalized identities represented or um, f f looking at ways uh, towards emancipation? So thinking about who is marginalized, how are they marginalized, why are they marginalized? Um, and you, th you think about the kind of um, the mediatization of issues around particularly misogyny. So in the past couple of years, we heard a lot of things about rape threats. We've heard a lot of things about uh, rape culture, the kind of um, sexist abuse, which is pervasive um, in schools. Um, and we have projects like Everyone's Invited, or well, Everybody's Invited uh, online, which are collecting experiences of especially young women in schools who have been um, you know, victims of sexual harassment. And these are all things that are socially mediated. These are all things that are done linguistically, the kind of things where people slide into DMs and harass. Um, so the objectives are, are mainly to understand. So it, th there are interventionist objectives. So finding ways that might uh, be suitable for challenging, um, uh, challenging those kinds of negative representations. So um, for example, early on in, well, before I joined CAS, uh, held a held a event in the House of Parliament with um, Tony McHenry and Paul Baker, where we took my PhD research on representations of same-sex parents in children's picture books, 
and presented my findings from um, well, the, the Corpus Linguistic Inquiry, but also findings from people outside of academia, practitioners, teachers, uh, people in the publishing industry, working with MPs and those kind of publishing stakeholders to say, well, here's a social problem. Homophobia is pervasive in schools and there's been Ofsted reports and Stonewalls reports in previous years um, to say that homophobia is pervasive. So how can we potentially intervene based on what we know um, might be positive representations in children's picture books with gay parents? So if you know homophobic behaviour is prevalent, how can we maybe represent um, gay and lesbian, bisexual, trans couples, people, identities? In more in positive ways and present those to children in in a, in a way which is uh, suitable to those age groups so was the issue that there there wasn't enough of that sort of representation or that the representation that was there was was problematic or both i suppose well, it, well mainly yeah not enough so there was a, there's a real backlash or there, there has been in previous years so um you can look towards section 28 and when when i was growing up which feels like a very long time ago so between 1998 and 2003 you had section 28 which was um, you are not allowed to talk about homosexuality as a pretended family relationship um in any child well, child directed kind of um institution so the government effectively banned talk about homosexuality mm -hmm. in schools um, so there's been a historic lack of um, representation, but that also creates a marginalisation. I think things are positively changing at the moment. So we, there's more educational programmes and due to the Equality Act, and uh, uh, we are talking more about um, LGBTQ plus identities in schools, which is a good thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm not an educational practitioner in, in those areas, but I, I know... Um, diversity and inclusion is is much higher on on the agenda. That being said, the current government and current talks about uh, between politicians, I think this anti wokeism kind of strain of politics at the moment, it, it, we could be looking at um, some quite regressive attitudes coming back and being popularised again. So there's there's a vital agenda here. So understanding the ways in which political correctness, for example, the discourse around political correctness has now changed to wokeism. Like how how does language change or how is language used during the different time periods to represent similar things and keep marginalized identities marginalized? Um yeah, what's the context around that? So we can yeah. Corpus linguistics is a way to look at those patterns and trends and changes over time. So um, how is beneficial. Your... How was your work received in in Parliament? I mean, well, first of all, what what was that like? I mean, I I can only imagine that was quite maybe quite a scary experience. But but also, how how was it received when when you did that? Yeah, it, it was very it was very positive, positively received. So it was um, it was kind of like a special a special um, interest group meeting. So it was uh, people who were invited to the meeting, industry spokespeople, um, sympathetic MPs. So we had. Uh, a Conservative MP at the time, Eric Olleranshaw, who was working in Lancaster, and Stephen Twig, who was working in West Derby from Labour. Um, so they were quite uh, sympathetic to it. And it was very well received. Everybody kind of said, yeah, this is the kind of thing that we need to be doing. We need to be looking at ways to, uh, if bullying is a problem, and bullying is a problem, if homophobic bullying is the kind of problem which is extremely prevalent and it's resulting in things like suicide and self-harm and these real real problems for children. Um, what do we do about it? How do we make some interventions um, based on what we know? And if we're looking at literature as a as one way to um, encourage just discussion, like positive discussion and inclusion around identities which have been marginalised, how do we do that? So it was a lot of hard work organising the event. Um, but I think it was very positive, but taking it forward then the hard bit. So after, directly after this meeting, um, <laughs> so I've, I was able, because of Eric Oller and Shaw's connections, to go and meet Liz Truss very briefly after that meeting, who was, at the time, um, she was the Education Secretary. So we had a very brief meeting, which it was 
okay, why do you want to do this? Go and get me some evidence, talk to the National Association of Head Teachers, go and talk to all these agencies who are already quite well aware of the problems that exist. Um, so it was, it was a bit more, then you, you step into the world of politics and the world of politics moves either extremely slowly or extremely rapidly. Um, yeah, and working with politicians, it can be a, it can be a tricky thing. It sounds like it. it sounds, oh, you, you maybe, you, who knows, maybe you met a future uh, prime minister. <laughs> yeah, very potentially so. <laughs> yeah, it at, felt, at the time of recording, at least. <laughs> well, it felt quite scary then. It feels quite scary. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm sure she won't watch this. Uh, <laughs> um, so you mentioned before a word which I think is is an interesting one. You said that there was a you had an interventionist uh, agenda. So if we sort of think about the work you've done on online discourses, um, try and un unpack that a little bit for me in terms of what what can you do to sort of go in there? Are we trying to protect the people who are are targeted by this quite extreme discourse, or is it about preventing it from happening in the first place or automatically detecting it. What are the kind of interventions that you have made or hope to make with, with this sort of work? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't characterize it as an intervention to the gender. I think the primary, the primary agenda for us as corpus linguists and linguists in general, people who are dealing with um, social problems is to understand the problems, mm. um, try and spot those patterns, behaviors, trends, um, in the way in which things are linguistically mediated. But um, yeah, the, I think the aims of being able to, we're not in the business of behavioral profile and we're not in the business of being journalists. We're not in the business of um, generally in, yeah, being big software companies, writing algorithms in order to, to detect things. But what we can do is provide empirically based observations about these behaviors, which might be useful to them understanding um, understanding the problem. So when it comes to things like nationalism, for example, there are extremely good people working in, in, in conflict studies, war studies, those kind of areas, nationalism, um, social sciences, criminology, sociology, who understand these groups through anthropology, through, um, through interviews, through yeah however they might observe these these cultures they know the language that they use they know the symbols they know the way in which they operate and organize so we as linguists what we can do is go a little bit deeper so we can we also know what those areas are finding but can we find um yeah ways in which people communicate um find out so as cops linguists what is frequent, how do these patterns associate with, with each other, which kind of combinations of, um, so say if you look at uh, the far right, for example, so you might use a, a code like 1488, so 14 represents Adolf Hitler, A14H, mm. 88, um, and that might correl correlate with something like, um, which I've found in some of my studies on uh, the Football Lads Alliance, might have things like 1488 plus pro Brexit. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so you might have things like um, these coded symbols of nationalism plus other things that are going on. So, yeah, how are how are things used together in co-occurrence, collocation, um, that go beyond maybe just having. Yeah, these these kind of word lists of well, these are dangerous things that might prevent present a signal on Twitter, for example. So if you have uh, somebody puts in fourteen eighty eight, or they put in Sig Heil, or they might put in whatever, that might be associated with one of these groups. Um, that might give Twitter a little red flag. But is it somebody critiquing it? Is it somebody saying, "Oh, these idiots using fourteen eighty eight in their profiles"? Um, so, yeah, there are inherent problems with um, producing algorithms and as linguists, we need to remember that our primary focus is on understanding how language is used in context. So you, um, you, you've also, I, I want to ask you about another 
um, quite distressing topic that you've uh, you've recently published research on with um, Samuel Lana, I think, up in up in Manchester. Um, children's online disclosures of sexual abuse. Um, again, I, I, you know, what what led you into this this area, um, and and how does the the use of corpus methods kind of help you to, I suppose, understand their experiences. Yeah, it's a it's a particularly awful yeah. uh, thing thing to look at. Um, so how we well, it coalesces around a, a range of interest that I have. So I'm just I'm generally interested in um, the treatment of children. So how the society view um, and uh, that they'll construe and construct childhood so what is the child um, but then also these like dangerous aspects or these uh, yeah it's obviously very negative topics of homophobia um yeah, nationalism racism homophobia uh, these things that lead to just these pretty horrible subjects so i met sam at a at a meeting at aston really it was the launch of IAFL, so the Aston Institute of Forensic Linguistics. I met him at the well, the, the launch of that, and he was interested in looking at uh, the child line message boards, which are a freely accessible um, resource for children to go to to seek advice and read um, advice from child line. So they act as a message board and children can post anonymously. So. Sam was interested in, in looking at how children go about making disclosures. He wasn't really focused on a particular topic, but we saw that there was message boards for sexual abuse and emotional abuse and physical abuse. And we were, we were both interested in how are these, um, how are these topics talked about, how, um, how the child line handled them. So we worked with child line and had approval from child line to, to work with these anonymous, um, anonymous posts. Um, so we collected collected a lot of posts, so a couple of thousand of them, to look at how children talked about domestic abuse. So when we've got these message boards that talk about abuse, how the children talk about domestic abuse. Um, and so Corpse Linguistics, what, uh, what the approaches allowed us to do was to look at those patterns and trends and ways in which there are commonalities, but across uh, different forms of abuse. So we've looked at domestic abuse so far, and obviously there are representations or ways of talking about feelings and um, we have these cognitive things. So things that I think and things that I um, want or need, so sort of potentially using those as, as ways into finding what most children are looking for when they make a post anonymously on Childline. But also these, uh, these feelings or how do certain forms of abuse make you feel? And we're exploring that in more depth. So we've only looked at domestic abuse so far, but we're going to go into looking at um, sexual and physical and emotional abuse. So trying to disentangle those behaviours. So there's already already a kind of macro, just by the design of the message boards, there's already a macro kind of structure of these topics. So if somebody wants to talk about um, a particular experience of sexual abuse, they would maybe see the message board and then post in there. So, yeah, trying to disentangle those behaviours and look at maybe patterns across those. So are there certain feelings which are associated with emotional abuse? And we found that things like depression and anxiety were, were very much present in, um, in those emotional abuse posts. So you think about, yeah, abusive parents or bullying at school or uh, think, uh, relationships with older, older siblings or younger siblings. Um, so, yeah. Patterns, trends, associations, really. How do you sort of uh, maybe cope isn't the right word, but how how do you manage with with uh, trolling through quite a lot of mm. really, you know, upsetting and distressing accounts from from children? Do you how do you are you able to kind of block it out of your mind when you're not thinking about that work, or how how do you manage yeah. with that? It's um. I think, that stuff I think is the most distressing stuff that I look at. So I've looked at uh, rape threats with um, Claire Hardacre on the, on the Dune project. 
and that was pretty horrible. So you you're getting the, there's I hate I'd hate to characterise it as trolling, but you get these kind of um, uh, I don't know these. We found that there were these networks of people who were um, piling on and sending this this abuse because it was it was seen as like something funny to do. It was um, yeah, but that was pretty horrible. But uh, it, it felt a bit more contained, and we were working uh, with Caroline Criado Perez, who was the the focus of this thing. And there was there were certain overt ways that we were able to go in and make interventions. So talking to Twitter about what they might be able to do um, with our findings, stuff like this is a bit a bit more difficult because it's anonymous. There's there's no way to really directly intervene and help the children um you're reading all these a, a variety of disclosures um so really quite distressing stuff and obviously child lines screen them before they they're allowed to go online um to make sure that they they kind of they don't have any personal identifiable information but it is involving children who have no control over these things um they the powerless like essentially socially and um, materially like generally quite powerless individuals so stepping away from that or coping with it is yeah, it's not it's not nice i don't think i've got a, i don't think there's any one way which works for everyone mm. um i think that trying to maintain um, the ethical integrity of a, of a project is is important so making sure that you're kind of checking in and it was good that me and sam are working together so we were checking in with each other making sure that we were both okay, working with, um, so Sam was kind of working with Childline to make sure that at each step our work was in line with what they were kind of expecting. But yeah, stepping away from the data, working with it. And I think corpus methods are, they do kind of help you to, I know that it can be a criticism sometimes that it, it helps you step away from the context, but it does allow you to step away from the context, observe the patterns, and then prepare yourself for going in to look at mm. individual texts associated with certain patterns. So say if you want to look at how somebody is, um, I don't know, if there is a specific form of abuse mentioned, so bullying, can you set yourself up for that data? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to work on some stuff about bullying today for a couple of hours and then step away. Um, but it is, it's extremely emotionally and mentally taxing. But uh I don't think we'd do it if it wasn't important. Mm. You you mentioned the the sort of ethical perspective there, and of course another big part of uh, a lot of the research you do looking at online discourse, I suppose, you know, from from a data protection perspective or an anonymity perspective. What what's your general approach from an ethical perspective to um, gathering these these large data sets of of online use of language? Is it uh, a free for all, or, or or are there really careful considerations to to take when you're approaching gathering what people are talking about online? Yeah, I think it, again it depends and it, it varies. So, uh, for example, uh, technologically and technically. So, if you look at the child line message boards, for example, um, they are freely available. Anybody can go to those message boards and read the disclosures and. Uh, if you wanted to sit there and copy and paste and put like collect them for yourself, mm. um, that's essentially the same without without all the technological stuff like an API or ways to collect them quickly. It's essentially the same as having um, anybody's random website. So anybody could go to my website and copy everything, and that's theirs. The same with Reddit, for example, or Twitter. Um, Twitter has API, so there is a, a technological interchange for you to go and grab loads of data, but Twitter limits you. Same with Reddit. So they allow, allow you to take certain amounts of data. Working on things like Childline, I think these are already vulnerable populations of vulnerable people. Working with the people who host that material is really important to, to make sure that you're working with them to protect the child, making sure that the work that you're doing is in line with um, the eventual aim, which is to help even child lines to understand better the, the kind of disclosures that are being made to them. 
so that's the main the main focus is helping childline and helping the children downstream really if you think about other projects that have kind of been involved in so you have the, the rape threat stuff with uh, twitter we were able to scrape all those tweets that mentioned caroline criado perez or were directed towards her um and yeah the, the, the ethical considerations were not to name the people who were involved um so deleting handles and things but we were working kind of with twitter to present the work to them eventually um the reddit if you think about again the kinds of communities that uh, again so me it's me alexandra crandall who works at lancaster university so she's just passed a phd and doing really well and she's working at edinburgh edinburgh university at, at the moment as a, an associate lecturer um veronica collar who's a prof i believe prof yeah, I think so. yeah yeah, yeah prof at lancaster university so we've, we've been doing some stuff on the the manosphere so these dangerous online community well extreme masculinist communities of online um well online communities which are particularly misogynistic so all these people who have uh, well, anonymous identities on Reddit in these communities, which are kind of open source. Anybody can go to them, search for them, find them, spewing vitriol about um, women, suggesting that um, <laughs> women women are plates to be spun. Mm. Women are there as a kind of sexual object in order to be used, mm. objectified and thrown away. Um, so dealing with those kind of populations, I think, is slightly different to dealing with children who are making disclosures of abuse. So in we, we might have disclosures in um, on Reddit, for example, um, but the same kind of things apply. And not anonymity across all the data sets, so person identifiable information is stripped out of them all. Um, Reddit has a different framework for when you collect and use data to Twitter does try and stay within those technological boundaries, but also we have responsibilities as researchers so thinking about what we were saying earlier what we're interested in is observing those patterns making empirically based observations about how language is used in particular communities um, so we can provide the context but we're not interested in saying that person's done this so let's go and find them <laughs> yeah um yeah so you, you might have these internet pylons where you have doxing for example that happens mm -hmm. trolls who might um, try and identify people and post their post their address online. We're the diametric opposite. So mm. we, we are interested in understanding how these ideological uh, or how these ideologies work in language. How language is used to reinforce ideologies, um, create and maintain certain social practices, uh, marginalise other people. So how are women construed and constructed mm. and uh, represented in manosphere groups, for example, same with these rape threats. Um, and then, for example, if you look at the child line data, who are who are the most common perpetrators, for example, who is who is performing actions that result in certain abuse? Yeah. Do Do you ever worry that you know by going out there and publishing research about online groups like you mentioned, the manosphere, the, people who have very extreme uh, derogatory views about about other groups of people. Do you ever worry that 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 leaves researchers like you vulnerable to to being seen as an enemy by these groups? So, or do you feel where's where's the line there in terms of you know you've got to obviously tell share your research and tell people what you're doing. That's the whole point. But but also by doing that, you know, you're potentially vulnerable to being seen as someone who's opposed to what they're doing and trying to stop them maybe yeah it's um it is a worry it's a, it's it's um it's necessary work i think if you, if you were working in law enforcement for example like you, you would not be named the, there's you are not personally identifiable unless somebody's tracking you or whatever um but yeah it is a worry i know earlier on in my work and, and this is to do with kind of public accessibility to research. So uh, the most the most problems I've ever had with the general public sending for, uh, I had one death threat and I had um, a particularly uh, 
awful letter when I, when I held the event in Parliament. Um, and that was to do, that was the day that the event was held in Parliament was the day before the uh, the legislation for same sex marriage went through. And so there's a particular mm. well, media context in which uh, my event and my research made sense to report on in um, the Telegraph in the time. So I, I got named as a researcher at Lancaster University. So I got this anonymous anonymous envelope with Michael Glashen, Lancaster University, and I came into my pigeonhole. So that's about as close as I've come to stuff like that. But then you don't you don't know. Mm. Um, it is a worry. Uh, I don't know. The main thing is the understanding. So I think, yeah, the job is to to find out what is going on in those communities, um, because the people who it directly affects isn't really me when people are talking about abuse, talking about sending rape threats to a particular individual, or especially these manosphere groups so that the targets are um, women. And well, we have a, we have a certain, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's a tricky question. Mm. I don't feel particularly worried, mm. but then also I don't really fancy going poking in the hornet's nest either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, probably for the best. <laughs> so um, you're you're preparing at the moment to to lead a, a project aiming to improve online safeguarding for children uh, in schools. You you recently were awarded uh, funding for for this project. Um, so what are your what are your plans with this work, and and what role will Corpus Linguistics have in in contributing to this project? Yeah, cheers for the leading. Um, we've, so we've yeah, recently been awarded a UK, UKRI Innovate UK um, Knowledge Transfer Partnership um, project working with um, between Birmingham City University and a company called Renato. So they, they have a software, a piece of software called Sensor Cloud, which is an enterprise management solution for schools. So what they do is they provide safeguarding solutions for online communications in schools. Um, what they have is a problem with, well, number one, identifying poten potential, um, well, in instances of safeguarding issues. So schools all have a, a person called a designated safeguarding lead. And this person is responsible for working within the school to identify and make sure that any issues about safeguarding, so things like anything to do with abuse welfare, um, duty of care character, uh, duty of care issues and the Equality Act characteristics, so um, anything to do with discrimination, um, threatening behaviour, X, Y, and Z, extremism, the prevent duty, all that kind of stuff comes under, under um, safeguarding. So the software that is available is able to identify certain forms of safeguarding issues, but it's not quite accurate. It's a bit, it, it tries to capture too much. So the idea is to try and well implement corpus linguistic methods to look at yeah patterns trends associations trying to look at empirically based uh, empirical empirical language use around some of the protected or some of the characteristics that they're interested in in capturing so things like self-harm uh, health issues uh, radicalization extre political extremism um, racism so how can we use linguistic research about racist discourse um online cultures of uh yeah online radical um communities like incels for example how can we look at patterns in those communities is that evident in children's use of yeah, networks at school so we know that there's a certain amount of uh, mainstreaming for example of manosphere discourse so in the manosphere you might talk about uh, things like cooks and so somebody somebody being a cook which is derived from cook old which is somebody who is um well typically a, a man who whose wife sleeps with other men in front of them and this is this is a masculine a masculine discourse so you might have cooks and you might have things like um even the word incel you might have things like simp which is again somebody who uh, demeans themselves in order to attract uh, a female partner 
Um, so they'll do things which the female partner wants them to do, uh, irrespective of, of who they are, well, if, it, if it's some detriment to them. So the kind of language that is evident in these communities is a present in um, the children's language and does that uh, represent a safeguarding issue or potential safeguarding issue? Obviously not just looking for those terms, it's much like mm -hmm. extremely serious stuff. So things like suicide, self-harm, um, all of that kind of stuff. And you're, so, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go on. <laughs> I was just uh, going to ask that you're, you're currently uh, recruiting for this project. Is that right? You, yeah, so feel free to, to give it. <laughs> <a plug. laughs> yeah, if you, I think it's on jobs.ac.uk. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you go to my Twitter account, I don't know if you're going to put my Twitter on. Yeah, yeah. Um, on, the, on the podcast or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's two weeks to apply if you'd like to ask any questions. I'm more than happy to pick up the phone or um, if you go to my Twitter profile and click the link, you can get directly to my teams and we can have a face-to-face -face chat. Um, so yeah, we're recruiting. Um, the 15th of August is when that closes. Um, and it's a really exciting project. So it run for two years, working with the company and the company are extremely enthusiastic about what they can do for children's safety as well, because this is working both nationally in the UK. So uh, their, their market, well, they're a company, they have a, certain things that they're interested in so they have a profit motive but they also have a, a safeguard motive as well so their market share of uk schools is growing they're also expanding quite rapidly internationally so in the us market as well so it's an excellent opportunity to to be part of a of both a university where um, we've just had an outstanding ref result uh, we're doing extremely well in terms of research and there's a lot of like, exciting research going on and also part of a really exciting and, and growing business who the main thing is how do we use corps linguistics to to do socially important stuff um and i'm not very articulate when it comes to this stuff so i, I really do i'm just do good stuff using really <laughs> really complicated methods well i i think it sounds like really important and, and interesting work so uh, i wish you all the best with with that project and i can't wait to to see what comes of it over the next couple of years um you'll be relieved to hear mark uh, that we are making our way to the end of the uh of the episode and we're going to finish by um pitching to you three quick questions um and we're we're gonna find out whether you uh win the uh or become the record holder for the quickest answers because uh, quick questions as i've discovered on this podcast don't always lead to quick answers here we go <laughs> not putting any pressure on you uh here we go question number one of three uh what uh, are the biggest changes you've noticed in corpus research since you began working in this area um, how long have we got <laughs> <laughs> um so immediately in response to that, I went to a inaugural plenary for Jack Grieve at Birmingham University when he first became a prof. Um, and one of the things that I really took from that was, and this was as I was starting to do um, a bit more in this area, was he, was he said that linguistics is becoming a data science or becoming more like a data science. So the data science approaches coding is kind of a, a, a much more fundamental skill so i know when when i did my undergraduate and masters there was there was no provision for for coding and half my job now is probably programming in python and r and um, to do things that concordance is well and conk is fabulous um i, I did my phd using and conk but it is restricted to and conk and what and conk can do um, so yeah, data science, we've, we're have we not just looking at words in a lot of ways now. And we're not just looking at text. We're now looking at, um, or we're not just looking at a corpus as a big lump. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at a corpus as lots of texts with lots of authors, with lots of variables, with lots of things that we can look at with, um, or triangulating those variables. So looking at uh, yeah, data and language use as a much more complicated thing. Um, so it's not a quick answer. And, <laughs> and like one example is when, for example, uh, two, two ways of applied this 
when we were looking at rape threats, it was looking at language and how language correlates with social networks. So how do we plot, for example, concordances and uh, frequency lists and co uh, collocations onto things like a social network. So when we have text produced by users that contain certain um, linguistic things, how do we map those in a network? So we've done that using Twitter data, but also using, um, well, Twitter data again to look at vaccine misinformation during, um, I would be remiss to not mention another project that I had, which was uh, with Andrew Keogh, uh, Professor Andrew Keogh, um, Associate Professor uh, Robert Lawson, and uh, I think she's a senior lecturer, um, Tatiana Grieshofer at BCU, so we had, it, and Matt G, and also <laughs> Dr. Selena Smith. So it's a pretty big uh, team. Uh, Trackcovid.com, if you're interested in it. But we use, use the data derived from that to look at social networks. So biggest change, corpus and data science. Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question two. Uh, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? Uh, word lists and dictionaries. Next question. Brilliant. And finally, uh, <laughs> you made up for the first one. <laughs> uh, how will corpus linguistics uh, make an impact, or I suppose continue to make an impact on the world in the future? Um, I think that as it, as it continues to prol proliferate, so it's going to have academic impacts for a long time. So uh, again, this is being talked about quite at length, uh, corpus linguistics having this Brandon problem. So it's not quite NLP, it's not quite topic modeling. Well, it's definitely not topic modeling. It's um, it's not com uh, computational linguistics or is it? Um, so it's, it's, we operate in this quite small little, very friendly, very collegiate and also like quite dynamic bubble. But yeah, so what do we do? The kind of stuff that I'm interested in is, yeah, emancipation. How do we look at things like discrimination? How do we look at those social problems by using corpus linguistics as a method. And I feel like that's kind of in and of itself, this proliferation of the method. It is a method that allows us to do really interesting things that get us to an endpoint. Um, the tools and the methods and the approaches sometimes aren't the end point in and of themselves. Like there is a place for that. And it's really important that we int interrogate and critique and question the science and the approaches and if you look at anything to do with statistics in the last 20 years, in corpus linguistics, that's going on, that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, is it log dice? Is it log ratio? Is it log log? Is it this? Yeah, what is it? Um, but yeah, impact on the world. I think, yeah, the, even looking at the uh, the KTP, that way we're going to apply corpus linguistics, that real world application of not just throwing an NLP tool chain at a problem because that's where we get into problems where you don't detect effectively safeguarding issues. It's understanding that there is a, a place between uh, the snazzy techie stuff mm. and the linguistic, understanding, the gra grammatical, the functional grammatical, the, the contextual, the, the critical um, approaches to linguistics. So yeah, proliferation. Well, I look forward to uh witnessing uh, this proliferation over the, the years to come. And uh, with that, we will bring our conversation to uh, a close uh, for this episode of Corpus Cast. So thank you very much, Mark, for, for joining us. It's been a really, really fun and interesting conversation. Um, and thank you, our viewers and listeners, for joining us once again. However you've accessed us, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, or even Pod Chaser, if you will. Uh, please let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes using the hashtag CorpusCast. And make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. CorpusCast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. And thank you once again for uh, watching, and thanks again. Dr. Mark McGlashan, Birmingham City University. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.